berserk, a pillar of inspiration for Dark Souls. We believe it goes deeper than superficial similarities. Others have shown you the artwork inspirations. and so on, but today we are going to examine the philosophical, character and plot themes that run through Berserk and Dark Souls. We will go through the broad strokes, then provide some ideas and give some speculation too. This is a more artistic video that doesn't get very concrete, as in essence they are two separate works. We hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. First, as it will be important later, let us go into some detail as to why Artorus is similar to Guts. It has been established that there is a design similarity. They both wield a greatsword, and have been put into similar poses for certain important design images. However, there are some similarities that go deeper. Guts is associated with the wolf. From a very young age, he fights with wolves, and he has to roam like a lone wolf. This is a recurring image. He then becomes like a wild dog in his berserker armor form. And this is also the image of his inner demon. Artorius possesses the wolf ring and is accompanied by Sif. In addition, both the wolf Sif and Artorius fight in a similar style, with similar moves and attacks. Guts is a captain of the raiders one of a handful of captains under Griffith. Artorius is one of the four knights of Gwyn. Guts after the eclipse inhabits the interstice, a realm that is not either in the ordinary world or the spiritual, like a fish jumping out of the water. Artorius in turn traversed the abyss, both are unmatched with a greatsword. In Berserk, there is a recurring theme that Guts, through his incredible strength of will, can not only endure debilitating pain and overcome great challenges, but perhaps even alter the flow of fate. Artorius in his turn is described as having an unbendable will of steel. Artorius hunted dark rays, and Guts hunts demons. Guts' sword can damage otherworldly beings due to his experience in the Eclipse and the number of deaths it has brought. Artorius' cursed greatsword can damage ghosts after a covenant Artorius made with the Beasts of the Abyss. Speaking of his sword, Guts famously takes up the broken sword and survives the Eclipse. He is the struggler. To create Artorius' greatsword, one must use a broken straight sword plus ten as well. So, we have many similar trends to both characters, and some of these aspects of Guts may become relevant soon. Let us move on to demons, as they are very present in both Dark Souls and Berserk. If you want a more detailed look at all of demons, do watch our full video all about demons here. There is a theme in both Berserk and Dark Souls, that it's ambiguous whether demons are good or bad, what is a monster, and what is not. This is a very powerful theme that recurs in both works. In Berserk, the five supreme demons are called the God Hand, implying that they are sent by God. Can they be truly evil if they are doing God's work? They are certainly given some sort of supernatural power, and Griffith may have seen God during his transformation. At the very least, the occurrences are in the flow of fate, within the theme of determinism. If it is meant to happen, if the threads of fate have been written by God, can it be evil if they are merely playing their functional role? And wrong for who? If their activities are good for demons but bad for humans, who is to say that the reverse is preferable? Consider this. The imagery of the band of the hawk being around a fire is repeated, with Gut saying he warmed himself there. Yet they cook meat on that fire. The prey of demons happens to be humans. Just because humans are on the receiving end does not give enough reason to call it evil. What about Dark Souls? 
Here, the demons are far more peaceful than in Berserk. The demons seem to inhabit their own world without having to slaughter humans. They are self-sufficient. The bad name they receive seems even more unfair in this light. The Guardian Soul describes the boss as akin to the beings known as demons. The beings known as demons implies that it is a given name, not a true name. It is a derogative name, and relatively speaking, humans could be the demons to another viewer's eyes. We plunder a corpse beneath Ceaseless, kill the fair lady's sister, and trick the blind girl. We slaughter a lord who is perhaps lying heartbroken at the centre of the earth. Perhaps we are the monster. This theme comes up most explicitly in Berserk after Guts' first encounter with the demon. In Berserk, after Griffith and Guts face Zod, they discuss it while nursing their wounds. Griffith says, I would say it could be something like a god, to which Guts says, more like a demon. Griffith replies, who knows, is there a difference? This again pushes the theme that these things are relative. Guinevere and a Taurus demon both seem hugely powerful, but why is the being with an alluring chest a god, and the one with horns a monster? Is being a deity relative to one's attractiveness? Of course not! This theme is also connected to the theme of choice and temptation to a darker side within oneself. Demons in both works chose to become demons. In Berserk, the one who becomes a demon must ultimately choose the fate and sacrifice the one they love most. In Dark Souls, we also believe, and with a great deal of evidence, that the demons chose to become demons. In addition, demon weapons use humanity to scale their power, reflecting the human sacrifice in Berserk that is used to increase demonic power. I encourage watching our demons videos for more, and certainly reading Berserk for its interesting demonic themes. Additionally, you will find there a theory in our video that Jeremiah was a demon king of Isoleth, and Berserk once again supports this. Later on in the Berserk series, there is a demon king who rebels from the rest of the demons, and is made an enemy of them, just as we believe Jeremiah may have done. We hadn't reached this character in our reading of Berserk at that stage, but check out the two characters' armours. Let us now look at some character patterns between the two works, and perhaps speculate on some further background history in Dark Souls, drawing from Berserk. In Berserk, Casca is, at first at least, in love with Griffith. Griffith is the leader of the mercenary group, and rescues Casca, a village girl, from a noble assaulting her. Casca slowly has to come to terms with the fact that it may be impossible for her to ever truly be with Griffith. Initially, he is focused on his dream, and later he pursues the Princess of Wyndham in order to become the next in line to the throne. Casca therefore attempts to contend with being something indispensable to Griffith. She says to Guts that she wants to be his sword, his blade. In a scene where Casca begins to see evidence that Guts cares for her on some level, Guts tells her to go back to her master, and that a sword returns to its sheath. Over time, she falls in love with Guts, one of a handful of captains under Griffith's command. Griffith then falls out of favour with the king, and is stripped of his rank. Let us look now at Dark Souls. Kieran is one of the four knights of Gwyn, the head of the Lord's Blades. But she is also specifically referenced as the Lord's Blade Kieran. The Hornet Ring also describes that she laid waste to Gwyn's enemies. If we were to draw a reference here, it would of course be to Casca, who wished to be her Lord's Blade. Casca was in love with Griffith, and being his blade was a compromise. Was Kieran in love with Gwyn? When we meet Kieran, she is mourning by Artorius' grave. It is not clear if she was in love with Artorius, or just cared for him deeply but Casca also had strong feelings for Guts, which culminated in romantic love. Just as Griffith was out of reach due to his intentions with the princess, perhaps Gwyn and his station meant that it was impossible for Kieran, perhaps a commoner, as Casca was, to ever truly be with him. With time, perhaps she fell for Artorius, who was always the man for her. If we assume this is correct, for speculation's sake, the rabbit hole gets pretty deep. Kieran was determined to earn her mask, with a single eye and ivory locks as a unique badge of honour. 
It led to Dark Souls fans wondering whether she really was a Cyclops. And we confirmed in a previous video of ours that the face that is purported to be hers, which looks ordinary, was a placeholder for a demo and is not really her face. The developers ensured you can't get an easy answer to the lore, and her helmet is non-removable. When this is combined with the ivory locks and Gwendolyn's questioned legitimacy as a child of Gwyn, it yields some interesting ideas. Gwendolyn has ivory hair. Kieran perhaps does, if the mask represents her hair colour. A further grammatical distinction that has yet to be tackled is in the Dark Moon Blade Covenant Ring. It explains that Gwendolyn created an illusion of his sister. It goes on to say that an unmasking of these deities would be tantamount to blasphemy. There is a plural here, an unmasking of these deities, meaning both Guinevere and Gwendolyn. It has always been taken to mean Guinevere, of course, as it is a simple process to undo the illusion of her. But the plural must mean it refers to Gwendolyn too, and Gwendolyn does have a mask. All it covers is his eyes. Could an unmasking reveal a single eye? Could he be the child of Gwyn and Kieran, born out of wedlock? If Gwyn is the Griffith character, then Guinevere, a fully legitimate child, does look strikingly similar to the princess Griffith has designs on, who would be the queen in the Dark Souls universe and Guinevere's mother. Both represent royalty and legitimacy, and so the similarity is interesting. I have not seen any images of Gwendolyn without a mask that look real. Perhaps this is another locked piece of data to keep the lore murky. And what of the snakes under Gwendolyn? This would be another interesting link. In Berserk, Griffith does not impregnate Casca, as she is already pregnant with Guts' child. Griffith's assault does affect the nature of the child, however, making it part demon. Gwendolyn himself is part monstrosity, with snakes on his lower half. Was a child in the womb interfered with? People have questioned Seath's influence. Perhaps Seath figured out that in the womb was a place when a change could be affected. This is all pure speculation, as a lot of Berserk will merely have integrated into the ideas for Dark Souls passively, without any conscious thought. The crossovers are intriguing, though. Alternatively, perhaps the disgraced firstborn son is the Griffith figure. This could make sense, as the firstborn son is stripped of his rank, and so was Griffith. Griffith was not a god of war, but he was the greatest general in the war Midland waged, never losing a single battle. The firstborn son was the god of war. Griffith ruined his hopes due to foolishness with a woman, and we have some reason to believe that a woman may have been involved with the story of the God of War. That is for another time, however. We will give a hint, though. Just as Griffith was connected to demons and stripped of rank and hope, so too was the firstborn son connected with demons. It has been mentioned that the Dark Wraiths and the Skull Knight look similar. Their design similarity is certainly compelling, but there may be more link-ups. First of all, there is a tower in the centre of Wyndham, or rather now, more like a pit that goes deep into the earth. It is called the Tower of Rebirth, and as it winds down there is a prison for a little way. It is said that no one has ever survived going much deeper and that there used to be a different civilization that was destroyed with the coming of four or five angels. At the base of the tower, we see many bodies with the mark of the brand on them, implying that they were used in a sacrifice to create a powerful demon. There was also a King Geyseric involved, who is speculated to be the Skull Knight. I am doubtful, however, that the sacrifice was in order to make Geyseric the Skull Knight, since the Skull Knight is an enemy of the God Hand, and usually, such a mass-scale sacrifice is made at an eclipse, in order to create a new member of the God Hand. Let us look at Dark Souls. In Dark Souls, there are Dark Wraiths who sacrifice humans to become more powerful. They harvest humanity. They have an uncanny resemblance to the Skull Knight. 
There is a tower that none can traverse safely that goes deep into the earth and eventually to the abyss. Within it are four kings with otherworldly power. There was in the cut content a king of the city too. When we drain the water away, we find mountains of bodies, sacrificed not for power, but sacrificed nonetheless, destroying the city. As the original Wyndham was destroyed, with only the top of the tower reaching above the earth. Additionally, Guts and Griffith both survive going down this tower, but Griffith's spirit is broken, and Guts brings out the man who will put great darkness in his life. Artorius did not come out unscathed from the abyss either. More broadly, this adds to the themes that are common in both works. Sacrifice for power. Power at the great cost of others. Demons, kings, dark wraiths, and those with great ambition all go to great lengths to achieve their goals. It seems that in both Berserk and Dark Souls, the ends often do not justify the means. Another strong theme that comes through in both Berserk and Dark Souls is the negative interpretation of religion. In Berserk, the religion is called the Holy See, with a pontiff at its head and a patriarchal system working its way down to simple clerics. Primarily though, the religion seems to cause more harm than good, or rather, it causes only harm. Through misinterpreting opaque doctrines, they cruelly punish innocents. They allow atrocities to happen without resistance, claiming one should not interfere as everything is God's will. They misguidedly worship Griffith as a miracle sent by God, and while he may be a part of God's construction, he is in fact a demon, one of the very things the Holy See fears. They hunt heretics. They allow the rebirth of Griffith by stopping Guts from preventing it, believing Casca is a witch. Plagued by ignorance and superstition, the Holy See is easily manipulated by Griffith for his own ends, at great cost to the people. In Dark Souls, they are also obsessed by heretics and seem to be plagued by ignorance and superstition. More importantly, however, it seems that the Church does more harm than good in the Dark Souls universe as well. There are clerical soldiers with spiked weapons, locked up maidens, one with a tongue cut out, a faith in which you can buy your way into and up within, cheating clerics and undead hunts. Furthermore, we believe that just as the Holy See is manipulated, the Way of White is rotten at its core, and likely had a hand in the creation of the Undead Curse. Check out our Way of White and the Undead Curse video for everything related to both and their murky connections, including similarities between Lady Fair Knees and Rhea of the Way of White. A recurring religious image in both works is the Caduceus. It appears in the religion in Berserk and several times in Dark Souls. We all know the Caduceus shields, but perhaps not much about what the symbol represents. The definition of a Caduceus is an ancient Greek or Roman herald's wand, typically one with two serpents twined round it, carried by the messenger god Hermes or Mercury. In Berserk, it either symbolizes Guts and Griffith, Two sides of a coin whose relationship leads to Griffith being incarnated as the demon Femto, or Guts and Casca, whose coming back together again allows Griffith to be reincarnated fully as the White Hawk and walk among the plane of reality. In Dark Souls, who knows what it represents? Two serpents is, of course, interesting. The Caduceus is described as an ancient symbol on both shields it features on. Could it imply that the two serpents, Karth and Frampt, are serving a master, just as the twin-snaked staff serves Hermes? Or just as in Berserk, could the coming together of both cause a resurrection that allows the Lord of Dark to be reborn, or the next age to be brought in? Finally, a religious phrase brings us back again to another core theme of both works. The theme of inner darkness and temptation. The phrase is very or nox. In Dark Souls, Verionox could, with its ambiguous Latin, refer to the darkness or night within oneself or soul. This is further supported by the instructions for designing the game cover to the artist responsible. In the DesignWorks interview, Hatuyama said that to help with inspiration for the cover design, she was told by Satake to face the darkness inside myself. This darkness inside oneself is a theme of Berserk too. 
Fanny seems to enjoy other people's suffering. Guts is tempted to become a demon and to give in to hate. All demons have chosen the path of evil power by their own will. Those who have died as demons or gone to hell are described in one of the first Berserk books as so numerous they are like an ocean of dark souls. This theme is there throughout Dark Souls as well. The temptation to continue the Age of Light as a Lord at the cost of humans, Seath's search for immortality at the expense of the poor subjects of his tests, the Dark Wraith's harvesting of humanity, our own quest, slaughtering and absorbing the power of perhaps more than any have before us. Most of the pain and suffering is due to the darkness within ourselves and others. Only Ulysseel is an exception, or used to be. The weakness of the will, temptation, fear, human frailty, and the darkness within oneself crops up in both masterpieces. It comes most strongly within the characters, and even within our own self, as we read Berserk with conflicting emotions, and as we play Dark Souls. Who we side with, whether we give up, and who we kill. We have the same temptations. As the fortune teller told Griffith, so it holds true in Dark Souls. You are destined to rule the world in exchange for your flesh and blood. But what she doesn't say, which is also the tragedy of both works, is that ruling the world is also at the cost of the flesh and blood of others.